Hi, this is great. Widening your JavaScript application. So I'm Alex, I'm from Quick Left in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, before I really start, if you do want to follow along in case you can't see anything for any reason, these slides are up on my GitHub, uh, slash Alex McPherson. They're in Keynote, so if you don't have Keynote, I've exported them to HTML. It doesn't do a great job exporting, so sorry for that. But they're there if you want them. So here's an overview of what this talk's going to look like. Uh, should I be here just so you don't get stuck in the, wrong, in the wrong panel? Make sure this is appropriate for you. Should I trust this guy, or is, did he just come off the street and he's telling me about JavaScript? Uh, I'm going to go through five different types of JavaScript websites or applications. And then I'm going to talk about signs that show you that you should level up from one type of application to the next. So should I be here? This is going to be a survey of organizational styles of JavaScript applications. How you compose your files, how you organize them, um, any tools you might use to generate them, things like that. It's going to be mostly non-technical, kind of foundational, but a good survey of the techniques that are currently out there. On a scale of JavaScript what now to TC39, the standards body for JavaScript, it's more on the beginning side of that. I won't be offended if you want to go to a more technical talk next door. My friend Jessica is talking about animations and CSS. So who am I? Um, I'm going to share some life-changing, really important information here that hopefully can help us bond a little bit. Uh, I used to use Sublime Text. I use Vim now. I prefer the, uh, the Railscast color scheme. I always put my commas last in my JavaScript. And I always, always, always put in semicolons. So the important stuff's out of the way. You can clap if you want. I'm not scared of that. All right. Who uses Vim? Can I see Vimmers? Vimmers in the house. Some nerds over there, a couple nerds in the back. They've all clumped together. Interesting. Um, so, so I'm Alex. Uh, I'm from Boulder, Colorado. It's currently on fire. Hope it goes out by the time I get back. I said this last year, too. Fires every summer. I work at Quick Left. We help startups um, grow quickly and make solid products that they can found a business on. Um, and here's the format for each of the, the types of JavaScript applications I'll be talking about. Um, I'm going to come up with some kind of a name for the type of application, talk about an example website, tools you might leverage if you're at that level of JavaScript, how to refactor to get to that level, and then signs that you might be seeing to show that you might want to level up. So the first one, type 0, because of course you zero index everything. Uh, Node.js, not node, no. An example might be your mom's cat website. Everyone's made a site for someone in their family that's just a couple of static HTML files, right? So um, tools that might leverage, none. How to get here, you write some HTML. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, when to level up, when you want to be awesome. So there's, there are a lot of things that you just can't do with static HTML that you obviously need JavaScript for. That's why you're at this conference. I'm going to breeze through this one. So the next one, uh, type 1, I would, I would call it a declarative JavaScript application. Uh, it might use some modals and maybe a carousel. Uh, your mom wants to show a slideshow of her cat pictures. Uh, so you throw a carousel plugin in there. You basically just include the script at the top, and it kind of takes care of everything. Um, you might use something like the JavaScript that's included with Bootstrap JS or something similar. Your HTML is controlling a lot of the behavior on the page through data attributes. And how to get here from a static site. Um, you might use some plugins. You might add like a slash lib or a slash JS folder. But you're still dealing with some static files here. It's not very complex. And when you want to level up from here, when you have too many plugins, and more importantly, when you start editing the plugins, that's a good sign that you should move on from using uh, non-custom solutions that you're just copying and pasting from around the web. Um, a type 2 application. And this is where we're getting into to more technical stuff. This is where you have a document ready. It's obviously not doc ready. That's not correct. Small titles. So an example of this might be um, a landing page for a more complex blog or something like that. Uh, it might have a help modal, something like that. Um, here's an example of what the code might look like. Does that show up OK? So we have a document ready. Um, on line three, we're binding a couple of events. We're closing a modal. We have some kind of an Ajax fancy thing down there. 
uh, some callback functions that are declared for dealing with AJAX uh, success and some errors. So that's pretty good. This is, uh, this is custom JavaScript. This is probably the first time a lot of people are writing code that actually does something. You can make it a long way before you get to this, this stage. Uh, how to get here from the last, the last type of application. You might have a main.js file that has your document ready call in it. Um, you'll, you'll still have a folder full of all of your different files. Um, and when to move on from this stage, when the line count of that one JavaScript file gets beyond a certain number, I'd say like two or three screens of text. It sounds pretty short, but there are much better ways to organize your code. And this is a great sign that I see a lot, multiple document ready calls. So it's pretty common to keep putting files in that say, when the document's ready and loaded, run this JavaScript. But when you have four or five of those, they can become a little bit unpredictable in what order they run. So that can cause some confusion and unpredictability for your site. So you want to level up from here. I would argue that uh, this type of JavaScript app comprises a lot of the internet. Just a, a rough feeling that a lot of people write a little bit of JavaScript in one long file. Um, but there are better ways to do it. So how do you level up once you have all these different doc ready calls that you want to organize? Uh, you get into this third, actually it's the fourth, type three JavaScript application where you start using objects. An example might be a small blog. Here's what a JavaScript file might look like to organize your code. Usually you'll declare some kind of a global namespace. Here on line one we have an empty object called app. We might have a couple of namespaces beneath that to store different things. On line three, maybe we're caching some DOM nodes. On line four, maybe we're storing data that we've already fetched from the server so we don't need to keep fetching it. We can check if it's already in there. Line six is the heart of the app. It's an initialize function. And that kicks off a cascade of other events. You can see I haven't implemented them. Line seven has a uh, bind events call. Line eight says fetch initial data nice and descriptive. You can tell it's kind of bootstrapping the page and getting it ready to go. So you write a bunch more implementation code, and then down on line 13, you have your document ready call, where you call app.init. This is a really important way to organize your code so that you can start working with other people. There's only one entry point into this application. All you have to do is grep the entire site and find your document.ready call, and then you can kind of trace it from there. So you can onboard people pretty quickly, and it's really predictable. You don't have some secret file that's also doing document-ready stuff off to the side. Um, some tools that it might leverage, you might start having folders. You'll have one global object. Um, you can put a lot of reusable functions on this global object. Let's say whenever an AJAX call succeeds, you have a little thing slide down that says, your data was saved, or something like that. Um, you can start factoring out common code that you may have re-implemented across the site like that. You don't want to repeat yourself. Uh, that's really important. I'll say it again. You don't want to repeat yourself. There's a joke there. Thanks for chuckling. Um, this is a good time to make uh, functions that have a lot of reuse. Um, so how to get here. You turn all of your document readies that you may have written into an init. You can call it initialize. I'm not picky about that but one function that kicks off your whole app. You'll have some kind of a namespace that contains your entire application. This makes it a lot easier to use third-party code, so um, you're less likely to have conflicts between your variable names and theirs. Of course, you're varring all of your variables so you don't leak anything globally, but you can leave one global object out there. And when to level up from this stage. When you have cross-dependent classes, when you have files that talk about each other and maybe extend each other, uh, if you're starting to get tired of DIY, if you've solved these problems before and you want to use someone else's battle-tested, hardened components for your site, uh, if you don't know where to add your event bindings, if you ever have a, um, a script tag inclusion order problem, can you raise your hand if you've ever had a problem on your site and you don't know what's going on, so you flip the order of your script tags around to see if that fixes it? Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty common problem, and um, there's a good way to solve that. Also, if you've ever written this bottom line of code, app equals window.app or an empty object, that's a similar symptom to having to flip around your script tags. It means that you don't know what order your files are loading in. Luckily, there's a solution. 
the fifth and final form of JavaScript applications. There's a pretty common uh, theme in a lot of these talks talking about modules. Can you raise your hand if you've written a module before of JavaScript? That looks like maybe 10% of the audience, so that's pretty cool. Hopefully this will be useful knowledge then. So the last type is modules and MVC. An example site is the biggest JavaScript application you can think of. What's the most complicated thing you've seen on the web? Uh, Gmail is pretty ridiculous under the covers. There are some presentation creation software that looks like desktop stuff. You know, the, the big crazy stuff where you say, who made this and how did they do it? That's, that's nuts. You can do this with modules and MVC tools. So tools that might leverage modules and some kind of an MVC framework, templates, and maybe a build tool. If these are unfamiliar to you, I'm going to walk through each of those and explain uh, some options for you and why they might be useful. So modules. Not many of you have written them. Um, there are two flavors that are commonly in use, AMD modules and common JS modules. But we really like to use AMD modules for lots of reasons. If you find a guy named Sam Breed around here, he can talk your ear off about modules for a very long time. Um, what they really are at the root of it is a meaningful file of code. And your code is organized by what it does, and it's written in a reusable way. They offer guaranteed results in the browser, so no script tag juggling or anything like that. And I think that they encourage better code. So I'm going to show you an example of a simple module so you can get a, a sense of what they look like when they're implemented. This is a fair amount of code. We'll take it a little bit slowly. At the top, there's a call to a function called define. And then there's an array of file names, underscore, backbone, something called util. I think that's something I meant to have, uh, have written here. And then something called tpl bang templates. So there are four things there. And then on line nine, there's a function that's taking four arguments. So the result of including those files we're having a hard time seeing it. The lights, have you the lights? We did the lights. Yes, the lights. But we can do command option shift eight, right? Why, yes, we can. No, that. No, the yes, I don't think we, we can dim the lights in this room, according to Adam. What I was just trying to do was uh, invert my screen so it might have better contrast. Um, someone said they were having a trouble finding my slides on GitHub. It's slash Alex McPherson. And then the repository is jQuery TO. Oh. This was first given in Toronto. My apologies for not giving it a better name. Do you see that in there anywhere? Yeah. yeah. So sorry about the light situation. Adam, should I hang on a second in case it can be changed, or should I? Can anyone do Jeopardy really well? Just go to accessibility options. Yeah. We'll just, I think this is second up, sorry. Yeah, that's okay, it's over here now. Bear with me. Ignore my, uh, my messy desktop, please. This is important to read, though, so this will be worth it. Accessibility, display, invert. Oh, oh, now we're cooking with gas. Wonderful. Is this more legible? OK, I'm so sorry. I'll start my explanation over. So at the top, we're including a couple of files. These are strings, but they're actually file names. So underscore, backbone, something called util, and what looks like a template down there at the bottom. The result of those files get passed to this function on line 9 as an underscore, a variable called backbone, a variable called util, and some, something else called a, a template called present form. And then I write, um, you don't have to worry about what the code means in this case. This is a backbone view if you've ever used it. So I write a, a bit of code that relies on other files. That's the important takeaway here. The code that I'm writing in this implementation needs everything that's being named at the top of the file. That's the gist of a module. And so you write regular JavaScript inside this module. And what you return is very important. So at the very bottom on line 26, it says return login form view. 
So what I've done is I've made a big object and I return that. Now if I require this module in a different one, I would put its name in the define block and I would get that value of login form view in my other file. If you've used any language pretty much besides JavaScript, they'll let you write code and include it this way. Uh, this is, for some reason, a new idea in JavaScript, and uh, we're pretty excited about it. <laughs> Relatively new. So those are modules. Those are great. Um, MVC. MVC is a design pattern. Uh, it stands for Model View Controller. A lot of back-end frameworks use it. Um, if you don't know what they stand for, I'll run through it in a nutshell. A model deals with data. So if you go to, let's say, the Twitter homepage and you have a long list of tweets, each one of those might be backed by a model that might have the author of the tweet, the content of the tweet, and maybe the date it was posted at. So a model deals with data. A view deals with how that data is shown to the, to the user. In this case, um, for JavaScript, it, those usually deal with events and um, getting HTML onto the page. And a controller kind of is glue. It ties everything together. Um, using a framework that organizes front-end code in an MVC kind of way gives you enhanced organization. Um, some options that are really popular right now are Backbone.js, Ember.js, and Angular. There are a ton more. Please forgive me for excluding your favorite one. Um, there is a great project on GitHub called ToDo MVC, which is a very simple to-do app implemented in, I think they have like north of 20 examples at this point. Um, so you can get a sense of how you work with each of these frameworks. Um, I happen to use Backbone, and I like it an awful lot. What I like is that it looks like regular JavaScript. So if you have an app that you're moving through these levels and you think it's ready to add some structure and organization by taking on a framework, it's really easy to take DOM soup, a bunch of event bindings and a bunch of callbacks for those events, and turn it into well-formed backbone views. Um, other frameworks can do that too, but backbone does it really well. So A++ would, would use again. Um, also with backbone, and I'm sure other frameworks too, you can take or leave different parts of it as they suit your organizational needs. So in piecemeal, you can use from backbone their router. They offer push state routing, which means that you can um, listen to URL changes in JavaScript and run code depending on what URL you're at. Um, they have a really powerful set of collections, which are groups of models that you can query almost like a database. You can say, give me all the tweets where they were published since yesterday, um, which is a pretty powerful query interface. They offer wonderful views, which are ways to set up little regions on your page that are isolated from each other. and um, generally let you have uh, better compartmentalization of your, your page. So you can use any one or all parts of, of Backbone, um, which is really nice too. Uh, templates is another tool that will help you manage a large JavaScript application. Has anyone here written JavaScript templates? Cool, it looks like about 10%. Um, I'm gonna have you keep raising your hands. So, this function is called render user. The, the meaty stuff is here on line six, where we're setting the HTML of a container element. And we're saying div name plus some variable plus some more HTML plus some variable. Have you ever written something like this in jQuery or JavaScript? It's OK. You can raise your hand. This is really terrible. You should never do this. Um, <laughs> and, unless you need to have it. Arguably, you can write it. But there's a much better way to do it. You can factor it out to use a templating language of some sort. This same string, it's a, a div with a username and an address in it, written as a template, would look like this. This, is, this looks familiar. This is like HTML back from the very first version of uh, our applications. When you write HTML, you should be writing HTML, not JavaScript. You should not be combining strings together. Um, so this puts you in familiar territory. You can see that on line two, we are um, using delimiters to break out into JavaScript, put in a variable, and then break back out of JavaScript into HTML. Most back-end languages have some kind of templating feature like this. We have um, ERB and Haml in, in Ruby, which is my back-end language of choice. There are a lot of options for templates. Um, I'll get into those in a second. So once you've written a template like this, um, that previous function becomes much simpler. 
we are still setting the HTML of the container, but we get this, this interesting function. Um, you have to trust that under the covers, it's going to return some HTML. So that's a, a pretty, pretty clean approach to it, and it lets you write HTML when you want to write HTML. Um, so some options for templating engines. Um, underscore JS, which is part of Backbone, comes with its own templating language. There's one called Jade, another one called Mustache, Handlebars, Dust. Just like MVC frameworks, there are literally like a million templating options for front-end code. They um, might have different delimiters. Some of them let you use CoffeeScript instead of JavaScript, if that's your cup of tea or cup of coffee. It's really your preference. Um, they all do the same thing, though, as far as I can tell. They produce a function that, when you call it, returns HTML. It lets you write a file that looks like HTML, but its output is a compressed, efficient mess of code that takes a while to produce. They need to be compiled. So how does it turn from this into something that is actually a function that's callable? It needs to be compiled. Keep that in mind. We'll get to that in a second. Um, Yes, next up is build tools. These will help you with compiling your templates. Um, build tools help when you have a lot of JavaScript and a lot of CSS and a number of files that need to be dealt with. They can help you with housekeeping tasks. Some common ones include uglifying your code. That means making it shorter. Minifying your code, that means stripping out white space and comments, concatenating your script files. That means putting 20 files into one very long file. Um, a build tool can also resolve module dependencies. So when we declared modules, we said, what mo which other modules do I need for this code to run? A build tool can deal with that. They can pre-compile templates. They can transpile CoffeeScript. They can literally do everything. Um, the one that is really popular and is written by a guy that's around here that you should chat up about it is called Grunt.js. Has anyone here used Grunt? Awesome. Uh, can you clap if you like it, if you think it's really cool? Um, it, it's task-based. So on the command line, which can be a scary place, you, you can say, grunt compile my code, grunt concat my code, or grunt do everything. And you can put them all together and get one big release built out for you. It's, uh, it runs off of Node.js. It's pretty, pretty cool. It, um, it fulfills a niche that is taken care of by a lot of server-side languages. So in Ruby and Rails, you have something called the asset pipeline that in its own way tries to solve a lot of these problems. Um, I have briefly looked into other languages. There is a, um, a library for Django that also has the word asset in it. I think it's just Django assets. Uh, there are pre-compiling things for PHP and CodeIgniter and things like that. So there are a lot of solutions for this. Um, there are, there are really good reasons why you should do all this to your code, why you should uglify it and minify it and concatenate it. It's faster to download. Um, it's better for you, your users to have fewer files coming across the wire. So it's something that you undoubtedly want to do, and Grunt makes it a lot easier for you. So getting a build tool into your, your process is pretty important, and <coughs> Grunt is the one to use. So you can use any one of these tools at any given time. You can adopt them piecemeal, in the order that makes sense to you, because they all solve very specific problems. Modules deal with code, uh, I'm sorry, modules deal with files that require each other and um, resolving dependencies between them. An MVC framework can help you when you have a lot of code and it needs some better organization and the structure to it. Templates can help you if you're rendering a lot of HTML on the client side, if, it's, if your server is not taking care of that for you. And build tools are really great if you don't have that built into your server-side stack, or if you want some of the extra power and flexibility that you can get by using Grunt. I think it's better than the asset pipeline and better than any of the other solutions that exist for, for back-end frameworks. So how to get here one piece at a time. This is not a, um, an approach that needs to be taken whole hog. You can really adopt it piecemeal. It's pretty awesome. Um, and when to level up from here, you let me know if you're doing something that can't be handled by these tools. I will be very surprised. Um, this is really the modern best practice tool chain for building a large JavaScript application. So um, a quick overview of the different levels. You start off with no JavaScript. Um, not many sites stay there, stay there for very long. You move on when you need to do something cool. 
the libraries approach. This is when you have uh, declarative JavaScript, so like Twitter bootstrap and behavior that's driven by what you write in your HTML. You have um, specifically formed carousel galleries of images and things like that. Uh, you move on if you start editing the, uh, the plugins that you're using and you want some more custom solutions. Then you move on to the document ready approach. Document ready approach is when you start writing your own code. And it's pretty powerful. And you move on when your files get too long or you've introduced a bunch of doc readies that are a little bit hard to organize. Uh, you might have some kind of a namespace or object based approach where you're starting to dry up your code. Do not repeat yourself. Again, do not repeat yourself. That's what dry stands for. Um, and you're starting to, to leverage a lot of the code you've written elsewhere to be used in a, a really um, repeatable way across your site. And then once that kind of doesn't scale too well and you're still having uh, file order inclusion problems and you want to leverage someone else's work instead of writing all of your own form validation stuff, which is terrible, and uh, templating and stuff like that, then you'll move on to this MVC and modules approach. It's really important to think about these five approaches as not being better than each other, but just really different. If you're making your mom's cat site and you know she's just going to put up a couple of pictures of her cat, you can stop there. You don't need to have grunt. You don't need to build task for that. You don't need anything like that. You can just stop at level zero, and that's OK. Um, but if you are starting to recognize and experience these pain points at different levels, you should feel comfortable in knowing that there is a path for you to travel to help you uh, organize your code and not feel like you're fighting to make changes that used to be easy that are hard now. Right size apps are OK. Um, you don't always need to start big, but you should at least think about it. So as you start your next project at work or a personal side project or something like that, think about what you hope it might grow into or what you know your project manager is going to ask for or something like that and maybe anticipate some of these future needs. It might seem like it's taking a long time to set up, but you can really save yourself a lot of headaches if you're building into the right size tool set. And know when to level up. Writing JavaScript is really fun. It's awesome, that's why we're here, and it should stay fun. It's not fun if you do not have the right tools backing you up. Uh, so I'm from Quick Left, we're in Boulder and we're hiring, and that's all, thanks.